Why don't we do this? Why don't we get started? Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time to be here for this uh, live training session with uh, Dr. Kirsten. I'm sure most of you know him. Uh, he'll talk about his background. Uh, how he's been around T-Scan for quite a bit, quite a, lo a long time here. Um, if you guys have any questions, so Robert's going to spend about 45 minutes going through his lecture and going through the actual T-Scan software to help you guys with the uh, uh, being able to look at common implant complications. If you have any questions, there is a chat section uh, in your Zoom that you can ask questions during the chat. And then the last 15 minutes, we're going to actually dedicate to questions and answers where everybody can ask um, any questions that they might have to Robert. So without further ado, Dr. Kirstein, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Shane. And thank you to TechScan Marketing for um, inviting you all to join us tonight to try to help you understand how the T-Scan can improve common implant complications. And I'm grateful for your attendance and the time you're gonna share with us. I'm gonna combine a PowerPoint with actual T-Scan data. So I'll be going back and forth. And, um, and uh, that way you'll get to see me work through some of the actual data um, in addition to having some background material uh, to support the, the, the cases I'm gonna show. A little bit about me. Many of you may know me, but um, just for those of you who don't, I've been working with the T-Scan since 1984 um, and helped TechScan with all the different iterations of T-Scan. We're now working with T-Scan 10, which many of you probably have. And I've published um, over 83 peer-reviewed articles on computerized occlusal analysis. I've also published uh, textbooks, uh, chapters on digital occlusion, where I wasn't the editor. And I've also been the head editor of these five volumes that you see at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the most recent three volume version of clinical applications of computerized occlusal analysis and dental medicine is a, is a complete treatise of everything that we know about the T-Scan, um, all the different applications, T-Scan and posture, T-Scan and orthodontics, T-Scan and implants, T-Scan and digital workflow, T-Scan and general occlusion, T-Scan and TMD, and so on. And I've been honored to work with um, 18 to 20 experts from the different disciplines in the industry who contributed. So that's something if you want to learn more, those of you who are attending, that's where you can begin. Um, and we can help you access those books. Uh, I am a consultant for TechScan, uh, and I've been one since 1997. My role is education, research, and training. I do not receive any compensation for sales any tech scan products and the opinions expressed tonight are mine and not those of tech scan. So as you all know, we're in the digital era of dentistry and uh, prosthodontics is being modernized. We have scanners and milling machines. We have orthodontic planning with Invisalign. We have CBCT and we have digital um, articulation, virtual articulation and virtual restorative planning. And all of that um, is encompassed in our modern day operatory where there are computers in every corner. Uh, we use lasers, we use milling machines. Whoops, sorry about that. And the idea is that we provide in today's digital world, very high quality dentistry to our patients. And the goal is to obtain high levels of precision with what's become known as the digital workflow where we can plan the surgeries, and we can plan the restorations all virtually and create them essentially inside computers to then deliver to our patients. But despite the amazing advances in the digital workflow, clusal and implant complications, restorative problems are actually more frequent than in conventional crown and bridge dentistry. And that has to do somewhat with the rigidity of the systems, which you're all well aware of, the implants have no resiliency in the bone, which is a significant problem. But the reality is that it's actually occlusal contact forces and um, let's say less than ideally installed occlusal contact patterns that create these complications. And most of that 
has to do with the cases being installed non-digitally. Here's an example of that. Uh, this is an eight year long study that was published in the Chinese Journal of Stomatology, 114 full arch implant cases, over half of them broke within that eight year period of time. And then another 26 broke secondarily. And this is probably not new to all of you, uh, the severity of it that 54% actually broke, but I'm sure you're all seeing some of your implant cases, chip porcelain and pieces fracture. And of course, once they fracture, even though we might have the lab put them back together for us, they will fracture again. And um, this is becoming a major problem in dentistry, the prosthetic complications, more so than the surgical complications for that matter. So the question is, why do these complications, these occlusal complications occur despite the many digital advances there are that are going on in clinical practice? Well, a big piece of it has to do with articulating paper and our ability to manage articulating paper. And in order to avoid implant complications, it's really important that those of you listening come to the acceptance of two very uncomfortable truths. The first one is studies show we doctors actually make a high percentage of errors in selecting contacts for treatment, actually greater than 90% of the time we choose the wrong contacts. And you've all done it and you don't even realize you're doing it. And well, I, I shouldn't say you've all done it, but let's assume most of us have done it. And what I mean by that is if you're putting in a single crown and you choose a paper bar to adjust and you adjust it and the patient says, no, it's not better. Well, you chose the wrong contact and it doesn't even, you don't even blink an eye. You just go and pick another contact and keep grinding until the patient says, yeah, that feels better. That's actually not a very good approach because when you choose the wrong contact, there is a potential for a lot of negative sequelae. I have patients who reach out to me all over the world who had one crown installed or two fillings installed where they had their bite change and now it's years later and they're suffering TMJ or they developed headaches and facial pain after having Invisalign done or they had a tooth extracted and now they can't chew on one side. So virtually any mi minor change to the occlusion can greatly impact your patient's comfort zone. And of course, choosing the wrong contacts is 90% of the time is a real player in our inability to manage our implant cases. The second fact that we all need to accept is that research has shown a number of times now that articulating paper mark size does not indicate differing occlusal forces. And this is by far the best example that I've ever come across. And some of you may have seen this in, if you've heard me lecture before. But this is an example of where three large marks are sitting on very healthy tooth structure and virtually no marks are sitting where there's exposed dented. And the counterpart teeth, three large marks sitting on very healthy tooth structure. And this is where theoretically the force is supposed to be concentrated, but look how healthy the tooth structure is. And then where there's no tooth structure, the enamel's gone, the dentin is exposed, there's no paper marks, the paper marks are at the perimeter of it. But when you actually measure this with the T-scan, you see the reality of that, that 50% of the patient's bite force is concentrated in this area. And what happens to the paper and the ink is it gets destroyed by this high pressure. And think about it logically. If the enamel can't survive in these areas, how can paper and ink survive? So what happens is the ink gets pushed to the periphery. That's why exposed dentin never marks. It's not because the two structures is, is shiny or smooth. It's because if the enamel can be destroyed, there's no way the paper and the ink can survive. And you can see that here, there's an incredible amount of pressure in this area. And then the three large paper marks are these low forces that I'm pointing to right here, mesial to this area. So this is how misleading the paper marks are. And this is why when we choose them for size or for color or for depth, we're not really control, <coughs> excuse me, we're not really controlling the forces in a very predictable way. So what the T-scan does for you it explains which contacts you should treat. And this way you avoid creating complications from poor contact selection. And this is really the, the, one of the great benefits of using the T-scan properly is that you map the T-scan data to the articulating paper marks, and then you choose the ones that are moderately high force or very high force. And you don't look at the colors and the depth and the shape, you just use the data to guide what you do. And that gives you a lot more predictability in terms of the outcome, because you're actually managing forces rather than looking at ink spots, trying to figure out forces. And this is a perfect example of that. This is a, a maxillary 
of overdenture against an implant hybrid. And this is the delivery day. And you can see there's lots of paper marks uh, spread out all over the, the uh, lower hybrid. And the question is, you know, what would we adjust? And of course, we all have our perceptions about what we would adjust, but it's very clear from the T-scan da data, we better adjust the lower forefront teeth or that composite on that hybrid is probably going to crack somewhere down the road. So what the T-scan 10 does is it guides the needed micro-occlusion adjustments. The micro-occlusion is the corrections to the contacts to control the forces and to improve patient adaptation. The macro-occlusion is the way the case looks. The macro-occlusion doesn't guarantee the micro-occlusion will come out well. So when you're delivering your cases and adjusting restorations and you're leaving dots on teeth, instead of assuming the dots are actually good or reasonable because they're all the same size, you need to use data to choose the marks intelligently. You may shape all the contacts any way you believe is a good way, but that doesn't mean that because they're all the same shape or they're all the same size that they're actually going to be they're actually going to be low force or uniform or simultaneous. None of that can be seen in the ink. And that's the misnomer of trying to understand the ink. Instead, it's better to use the data to understand the ink. And that's what I'm going to sort of show you how to use the data to look at your outcomes. So in order to um, install implant prostheses, you essentially use sequential T-scan recordings that are followed by T-scan guided occlusal adjustments. And you try to treat and closure all the rapidly rising high contact forces, excuse me, go forward. All the rapidly rising high contact forces. That's not only the pinks or the reds, that's any uh, columns that rise faster than the rest of the arch. And I'll show you what that means with some real data. And then when you adjust those rapidly rising high contact forces, you immediately make another recording that guides the next round of adjustments. And then again, you treat the next set of fast rising high contact forces. And you continue that process until a low force, widely uniform force profile is created. And that usually centers the center of force, which is an optimal outcome. And once you do that, you can um, make excursive corrections to the right and left excursions and the protrusive excursion. But balancing a dental prosthesis or an implant prosthesis tends to occur before treating the excursions. So this will just give you some background on how this is done. First, you record the occlusal force profile. This is an orthodontic patient, age 15, who finished braces with a 62-38 imbalance that was not detected by the orthodontist. He developed headaches and facial pain um, shortly near the completion of being debanded. And after a few months, he was sent to me to analyze his bite. And he's a perfect example of how you map the forces to the T-scan data, so the, MAC, the, the T-scan forces to the articulating paper marks. So if we look at the mesial of the first molar, there is a very large mark that is a pink contact. And if we come a little more distal and a little more facial, and we have a moderately forceful green contact. And then if we go distal to that contact and lingual to that contact, we have a moderately forceful orange contact. And then if we come over to the next two, Again, staying on the lingual half of the tooth, there's the next high force contact. And then if you come more, mes more distal and to the buckle, you have a low force contact or a low to moderate force contact. And again, I want to reiterate, if, if you really believe you can read the marks, the marks will fool you. As you can see, this is the biggest mark in the side, and it's the lowest force of the ones we were trying to map. Right? So there's no way to really know from the size of the mark that what the forces are. And that's actually what the research is showing. So here's a case that illustrates the process. And I'll show you this, and then I'll go into the T-scan data showing you a, a couple of different examples of how we might do this. So this is a patient who had his uh, sleep apnea patient who had his mouth, um, his vertical opened with an appliance. And I'm gonna go in and crown all his teeth at this new vertical and jaw position, um, which is where the sleep apnea doctor wanted me to make his case. So I section the appliance. I'm going to prep these teeth against each other and make a provisional. And I'm going to remove a section over here and prep the posterior teeth on this side against each other. Then I'm going to remove this piece of the appliance that takes out three front teeth. I'm going to prep those top and bottom, and I'm going to con continue to add them to the provisional. And finally, I'll have enough vertical stops that I can just crown these last six teeth. And of course, we do this with 
veneer crowns because we don't need to crown everything and overlay crowns in the back because we don't have to strip off tremendous amounts of enamel because we're really building up. And he went through a provisional phase, but ultimately we got to the day of delivery. And this is the day of delivery. And you can see I've um, lowered the vertical and I have all the teeth in contact, but this is really an illusion. This is the macro occlusion illusion. And that's because what it appears to show is that the occlusion is good. But the truth is, unless you put the T-scan sensor in there, you really don't know if the occlusion is good. And of course, when we did put the T-scan sensor in there, we found out that actually only three areas of the arch were actually in occlusion and they were holding up the rest of the case. And that's the canine left area, the canine right area, and one second molar. And I apologize to you guys for the no numbering. I've been all over the world speaking and I have mixed many numbers together. So I will, um, in the T-scan, actual T-scan data, you'll see the real American numbers that we're all used to. So what you do with this information is you then map the data, the high force fast risers to the, to the carbon paper marks, and then you know where to adjust. And you know, so in this area, we're adjusting here, here, and here. In this area, we're going to adjust here and these two contacts. And this one is low force, which you see here, and we're going to leave that one alone. And then we make another movie, and we do this sequentially. So I'm going to skip ahead to four movies later. And you can see that the left anterior corner is still too early. The center of force, if you watch it, actually starts in the canine on the left and heads to the middle. And that actually is... Um, not really good. It doesn't really matter that it goes to the middle when it starts so far out of the middle of the arch. So this is really early. The left anterior area is really early and everything else is after that. So again, you do the same thing. You map the paper marks to the data. And this is a really important area. These two marks are almost exactly the same. One's a little bigger, one's a little smaller, but from the standpoint of color, they look virtually exactly the same. This one is low force, this one is high force. And the question for you is how would you ever know by looking at the ink? And the answer is, of course, you don't know. So you might choose the bigger mark, but sometimes it will be reversed. The bigger mark will be low force and the smaller mark will be high force. And you really won't know. And this is why installing cases without the T-scan is such a compromise. And here's an example of that. This is fairly high force on the right side. This um, a moderately forceful contact on the palatal cusp of the first molar, and the ink mark is this sort of a smudgy little scratch. So there's no way to really judge them by how they look. So after five adjustments, we now have some simultaneity. We see things are similar. There's only light blues, light greens, and maybe one yellow and one orange brown. And the center of force, it starts in the middle and it heads towards the middle. And it actually pushes a little anterior, um, but it hugs the midline. And so again, we're not there yet. We again map, and you can see, again, the palatal cusp with the first molar is a sort of a scratchy little mark, and these other lower force areas are darker marks. And this is the challenge we all face every day, is how to know which contacts to treat. So when you get to the end, you wanna see something like this, where you have only low to moderate forces. The color scale is only up to the middle. You can see it down here. There's good simultaneity. The colors change similarly. You don't see anything shooting up too fast. And the center of force stays near the midline the entire time. And so this is an optimal outcome. And from here, we would go on and look at um, right and left excursions and the protrusive excursion. So let's talk about how we can use that process to avoid implant complications with, with a few implants. And then I'll show you a full arch case. So uh, again, some background, when you have unilateral implants like this situation or the case I'm gonna show you, which is actually me, you have um, certain goals you're trying to achieve with the T-scan. First, leave the implants with a low force profile and move the force summation, the center of force away from the implants to the other side of the arch. So you know, there's only implants on one side, you want the center of force away from the implants. And the reason that's important is because the implants concentrate stress because they're immobile and they tend to drag the center of force towards them. In a case where you would have, let's say you had two implants here and one on the other side, you'd want the COF on the other side where there's less implants. So you favor the side where there's less implants. You also try to create non-simultaneity. This works really well with um, distal extension prostheses, and that's something that um, I can show you um, 
privately, or I'm not actually going into that in this lecture, but that's really works well with the distal extension prostheses where implants make up the, the back end of the arch. You can have all the anterior teeth and the opposite side natural teeth load before the implant prosthesis comes together, which is really unique use of the timing features of the T-scan. And, and a very important goal is to remove or lessen forces in the excursive movements where possible. Now, why do I say where possible? Well, if you're making an anterior implant bridge from premolar to premolar, you can't remove the excursive contacts. But posteriorly, you really don't want any excursive contacts on the implant crowns because that creates a lot of shear stress and flexion driving the implant crown into the bone, pushing it laterally. So you really want to have a lack of excursive contact if possible. So this is my case, actually. I have two implants uh, on my upper right side that I had uh, needed to replace two teeth that I lost. Um, I was a Coca-Cola generation child and I lost a few teeth. As I became an adult, I had endos and endos failed. And ultimately I got two implants placed by the periodontist and um, custom abutments made. These are Atlantis custom abutments. And this is an onlay that I donated to a fellow dental student of mine in 1983 so he could graduate. And that onlay is still there. So now this comes to deliver these two units. So here's the case in the mouth uh, at the delivery day. And here are the articulating paper marks. And um, these are my own teeth making marks. This amalgam has been here since I was a kid. This amalgam has been here since I'm a kid. And I'm 64 now. So, um, but you can see that my own teeth are in contact. But there appears to be a fair amount of ink on this tooth. So let's go into the T-scan now and look at what we did on that delivery day. Ah, well, the last thing I'm gonna show you is, again, we map, same, I should have showed you this slide. We map just like we do, I showed you previously, the contact forces to the data on the T-scan. And that's how we know what to adjust. Okay, so let me go into the T-scan. I have to stop my share and then reshare. Here's my T-scan and then share. Okay, you all should be able to see my T-scan. And this is the first movie of the delivery. And uh, after the vertical was reestablished, so the crowns were ground down to the point of that picture. Let me see if I can pull up the picture. Yeah, so here's the picture that you just saw. And this is where we're at. And we're about to adjust this situation. So we make, I'm making a, a recording. I'm recording, I'm holding the sensor in my mouth and the dentist, the, parent, the prosthodontist who's working with me, he's gonna do the adjusting. I'm biting down, I'm holding my teeth together and then I'm going to the right. So the closure part here, let me close this up. The closure part is here. And the way to look at this data is to drag the mouse through and look for rapidly rising uneven forces. Now this is on my natural teeth, so I'm not overly concerned about that. These are fairly shared simultaneously. The implants are here, I4 and I3. And up to B, you see there's really not a lot of high force on the implants, but the T-scan shows us that there's 20% of the force is on implant number three, and the center of force is actually coming down the right side of the arch. That's not what we want. We want it on the other side of the arch. So I'm gonna have to reduce some of the volume on this two on, in this area in order to lessen that. And then excursively here, so how you use the data is, as you saw me, I dragged through to about here. I don't play the whole movie. I use my eye to see what happens. And I can pick out the early rises and the fast rises. And of course, they're mostly on my own teeth. And I didn't bite as hard as I could have, or maybe we could have raised the sensitivity one notch, but the basic uh, output from the T-scan shows, you know, this. Um, you know, almost 28% of the force is on these two implants and the center of force comes right. Then I want to look at the excursion. I click to where the excursion begins and then I drag through and you see, unfortunately, the center of force goes right towards the implants and then over the implants. That's extremely undesirable. And we have a very nice feature in the T-scan that I'm going to show you. It's called tooth selection. I'm going to try to dis determine how long the implants are actually involved in the excursion. So I'm going to open the timing table. I'm going to choose tooth selection, and I'm going to select four and three. And what I get when I do that is I have an individual curve of this is tooth number three's force curve. Here's where I'm biting down. Here's where I'm holding my teeth together. Here's where I go to the right. 
then tooth number four obviously generates about half the force that number three does. And here's where I'm holding my teeth together. And here's where I go to the right. So tooth number four actually dissipates pretty quickly. And here's another feature that might help you. I'm gonna blow up the excursive period in this zoom graph. Well, it disappeared on, let's see, maybe it won't work in this. We'll have to come back this way. Um, we're gonna to have to do this on our own without the zoom. It may not work in, it may not work in Zoom. So you can see the blue curve reaches zero here. So if I move the D line back to the where the blue reaches zero, then I go into the timing table. It says that the premolar is involved in the excursion C to D 0.28 seconds. That's fairly long. Let's go back to tooth selection. And the green line, it'd be hard for you um, to see this. That's why I was trying to blow it up. But the green line ends about there. The green line travels across the bottom of the screen. And then if I go back into the timing table, I find out that the, that the second implant, tooth number three, is actually involved in the excursion for the almost the entire excursion, 0.44 seconds. And as you watch it play, you'll see how the center of force goes directly towards four and three, and then three hangs around on the screen there. Right? So we have to make some adjustments to both the closure and the excursion. And the timing of the disclusion on the implants is too long. So the next movie, again, after making some adjustments, my, my prosthodontist friend, he's making the adjustments. He's very careful. And now you see the center of force is on the left side of the arch, which is actually a bonus. That's what we really want. We want it to be over here. And he did reduce some volume, but there's still a fair amount of volume on um, implant number three. So that's probably not desirable either. And then when we go into the excursion, the blue quadrant is the posterior right. That's this area. The blue line is representing forces in the posterior right. And what you'll see is that again, despite making some adjustments to the paper marks, there's still this very similar uh, pattern of the center of force going over the implants. What we really like it to do is to go like that way and miss the implants. So we have to keep working at it. In the left lateral, the, the implants aren't overly involved, but here's the closure path. You see I'm still coming left. That's very good. And in the excursive part, you'll see the center of force goes away and the implants dissipate very quickly. They actually dissipate about that far. And that timing would be in 0.13 seconds. So that's actually a very good um, disclusion of the balancing side. The implants disclude very quickly when the patient, when the patient that's me goes left. So we'll come back to the right movie. Here's the closure piece again. And you see it's very similar. I bit a little harder. Same early rises on my natural teeth and the second molar, but there's still this blue quadrant group function there that shows the center of force going right over the implant. So I have to say to my prosthodontist friend, you have to grind more. I said, you know, you're being too careful. You know, he's, he's a cautious guy, and, um, but we're not making any progress. The center of force is still going, if you look at it carefully, it's going backwards and then it's going over the premolar implant. That's not desirable. So more has to be done. Closure part, it's very similar. This is ideal. The center of force is on the side of the arch away from the implants. Now there's less volume in here. You see there's a lot less blue. This came down from eight to five, and this came down from like 15 to 11. So there's actually been an improvement. But again, the software is very intuitive and you can see how the blue quadrant is still involved. So let's see what the center of force does. And again, he didn't do enough. And I'm gonna, you know, I, I'll take the crown out of his hand and. Do it myself, I think. Uh, we'll skip the left lateral because that one is pretty clean. Here's the right lateral that is at the end of the case. And you'll see the closure still goes left. If anything, I may have gotten tired after all this biting and sliding, and I really didn't necessarily squeeze hard enough. But we can still see the pathway goes to the left. And the closure part, now we watch the center of force and it actually misses the implants. So let's go back and do our tooth selection and see how long the implants are in the excursion now. So tooth selection, four and three. And you can see the blue curve reaches zero about here. I'm gonna move that back there. That's C to D, that's the timing table. We have to read that is about two tenths of a second. So that actually came down from about three tenths of a second. And let's see about tooth number three. Tooth number three, that's where it discludes right there. 
And that timing duration is 0.26. So it came down from 0.44 seconds to 0.26 seconds. So from a half a second, it's actually reduced to a quarter of a second. And the, the value of that really is in what the center of force does. Watch carefully how the center of force, when I stop moving right, it avoids the implants. That's a desirable outcome. And that's really the power of the T-scan. You're looking at fractions of seconds that make a huge difference to the loading. Up to this point, every single one of these movies, I'll go back one, you see how the center of force went right towards the implants, even with some adjusting. This end result here is the desirable one, where the center of force misses the implants and goes towards the canine. The left lateral, as I said, we don't have to do too much with that. There's the closure path, again, hugging the left side of the arch. This is really ideal. And then in the excursion, you see the center of force moves away from the implants and quickly they dissipate even before tooth number two does. Okay, so let's go back to the PowerPoint now. So let's share my screen again. PowerPoint, yeah. And slideshow. Okay, so we try to move the implants away from the, the, from the force formation from the implants to the opposite side of the arch, which we did do. So this was the, how the paper mark pattern came out afterwards. And it, from the premolar standpoint, it doesn't look that much different, actually. I would say right through here, there's less contact. You can see there's less contact. But the closure stops look virtually the same. And certainly the buccal cusp is getting grazed a little by the opposing lower tooth. That would be something we might want to remove. But you see how much less contact there is on tooth number three. And we have central fossa, cus tip, cus tip, cus tip, basically three or four contacts. None of this working side group function to the buckle, none of this working side group function to the lingual, none of this working side group function to the buckle. And you see my own teeth, virtually the same marks, right? So we haven't changed the occlusion very much at all, but we did optimize, especially the path of the center of force, so it would go like that towards the canine. Okay, now let's switch to an all on X case. And this is more of a full arch case. Um, this is um, modern day dentistry with zirconia. So you have different goals. Uh, same goal of eliminating locations of force excess, centering the forces. Here you want the center of force to be within all the implants rather than favoring any one side. And again, you wanna create low force uniformity. So different goals with similarity to the implants between teeth, but basically trying to get all the forces within the middle of the implants. So this case was one that I um, photographed during an in-office training, which is something that I offer dentists who wanna take their T-scan game to, to a higher plane, is that I'll come to your office and teach you how to use the T-scan on your patients. So this patient had um, dental neglect, uh, he had uh, lots of decay, broken roots, um, retained roots, fractured restorations, periodontal disease, lack of home care. And he ended up having all his teeth removed and um, having upper and lower all on sixes made. And these are the provisionals that were in place until the final restorations were made. And the final restorations were milled out of zirconia and then colorized. Even the attachments to the so the implants are all, this is one piece solid milled, designed and milled, and then colorized. And there's a little cant because I took the picture from an angle. The case is encanted. It's just the way I shot the picture. And again, this is the macro occlusion. But the macro occlusion, and this is really important that you understand, the macro occlusion does not guarantee you a good micro occlusion. And it is the micro occlusion that matters to the patient's adaptation. It matters to the longevity of the materials. It matters to the longevity of the implants in the bone, right? The macro occlusion, you know, this is like the beginning of the, of the final phase. You get the teeth made, but that doesn't mean that the occlusal contacts are very good at all. So the smile came out very nicely, um, but before I came to the office, it was designed, the case was installed with articulating paper. And again, what can you see here? Not a lot can you see here. There's contact, but what does it all mean? When did it happen? How forceful is it? What is the simultaneity? Where are the forces located? Are these good contacts? Are these bad contacts? Right? Are they high force? Are they low force? Well, it's actually impossible to know. And that's what I want you to understand. 
The T scan shows you the answers to this with one good recording. And this happens to be the, the, the right side. And the right side was a problem for this patient. So before I leave the PowerPoint, I'm going to show you the initial recording we made the day that I worked with uh, Dr. Al Petkin. And um, uh, this is using the STL file, uh, which is a great um, advantage to T-Scan 10. We have the ability to put an STL file into the, into the data, and you'll see that <clears throat> when I go into the T-Scan. The patient made two bites. The first one was weak, and this is very important that you have your graph up. If you notice in the implant, my own implant case, I kept referring to the graph. Your graph can be turned on with this feature right here. So if you don't have a graph at the bottom of your screen, you're not seeing the, the capability of the patient, and you're also not being able to read the time or to calculate time. So the graph is very important. This is where you turn it on. It should be on in every playback. So we're just going to look at the second bite because the second bite is a full bite. And you'll see the evolution of how the right side, there's a fast rising force, then another fast rising force, and another fast rising force, and then the left side is late. And so here's another example of how the center of force ends up in the middle and it gets, says it's balanced at the end, but it is not a good balance because there's no simultaneity. So you have to have balance with simultaneity. Here there's non-simultaneity. The right side is way in advance of the left side. And these are the carbon paper marks you were looking at in that picture I showed you where I asked you all the questions. What can you tell from them? Which ones matter? Which ones don't? Well, the STL file shows you where you have to adjust. Implant number seven distal, tooth number four, or crown number four, implant number three. And we also have three implants already under overload warning, which is another wonderful feature of the T-scan that uh, where you label your implants, if they're being struck too forcefully, they get an overload warning. And you can see here are two implants that aren't showing an overload warning. So the sequence of events, how you fix this is you adjust these fast rises. So you'd adjust here, and then you would adjust there, and then you would adjust there. And then this gets worse, and then you would adjust there, and then you would come here and adjust this. These two just get worse as the patient bites down. And those are the only adjustments you would make. You don't, you don't look at the other areas. It doesn't matter what the ink marks look like through here. These are all low force contacts. This is actually a very desirable distribution. There's contact on every tooth. So now we'll go into the T-scan, and we'll look at this case with real data. Here we are. Okay, so let me just move this down here. Okay, so here's the first movie. And um, you can see, I'm going to play it again, doing the same thing. I'm going to drag through, right? And this is a skill I want you to develop. I'm dragging through, I'm stopping when I see things I need to recognize. And then I get to B. And B, if placed correctly in your data, which is at the point, what B stands for is where static intercuspation begins. It's where the black total force line turns sideways. That's where all the forces rise, and then the patient squeezes the full contact. So B is the actually end of the sequence of loading. So if you watch it again, there's tooth number seven, <clears throat> right? Then tooth number four, and then tooth number three, and then tooth number 14 distal. Those are the main players. And three has two areas, right? Right here and right here that are going to be adjusted, mesial and distal. And so you go in with the paper marks and you mark here, 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 and here, and you grind some away. And with zirconia, you have to grind fairly aggressively if you want to make a difference. Um, so here's the movie after the change. And again, he made two bites. This bite is about 80 to 90%, 89.7%. This bite reaches 100%, meaning it, this has more data in it. So this is a better piece of the data to look at. And that's one of the reasons making a two-byte recording is very useful. You can see one bite is weaker, one bite is better. And uh, sometimes they're both very good. But typically, you're going to see one being better than the other. And this is where there's more data. And you'll see more disparities when there's more data. So I'm going to drag through here. And quickly, you see that... Uh, tooth number 13 is in overload. The center of force actually goes towards it. See how it's going towards it? And then it turns to the right as the right side adds force later. And then it jogs back to the left as the left side adds force again. I'll show you that again. There's the left side. Center of force heads that way. Now it's going to head to the right as the right side adds low moderate force. 
And as we go a little further, forces go up on tooth number four again, while forces go up on tooth number 14, and, and that's an area of very high force. And then you see 14 adds another contact. So the center of force goes like this, zigzagging, right? That's not what you want to see. But we know exactly where to adjust. Four, three, 13, 14 mesial, 14 distal. Right? And you just mark these areas and pick those contacts and disregard whatever else you see. Next movie. Again, a weak bite and a stronger bite. And notice in the stronger bite, the green line is much higher than the red line compared to the weaker bite. So there's a much bigger left to right imbalance in this um, uh, second bite. And that's why it's so important to do more than one bite. You often get a better uh, data set to work from. And here you see the earliness of the 13, 12 area. The center of force is still starting over there. Then 14 adds some force while three adds some force. The left side is adding a lot more force now. The center of force turns back towards that area. Right? And then you see the right side add a little force in the in number seven area. So you see this, there's actually, you know, this sequencing, you can see how this jogs around, but what you want to develop is the skill to see the sequencing. There's the earliest contact, then the next set of contacts, and then the later set of contacts. So we would be adjusting basically all of this, that, and that. And again, disregard anything else that, for example, you disregard the mesial of three, you'd be looking for the palatal aspect of three, the central fossa of three. Here you would disregard, if you had three paper marks on 14, you'd take the mesial one and the distal one and the one that's in the middle, you would leave alone. And that's a skill that you have to develop. And that comes from mapping the arch exactly, right? And this is something you can see that the T-scan arch, the marginal ridges are exactly matched to the, to the digital arch. And this makes it very simple to find where to adjust. Here's the next movie. The first bite is better than the second bite, which does happen. So we're gonna use the first bite. Now notice there are no implant warnings anymore. So we're actually making progress. And this is all done in one session, but again, the T-scan is a challenge to beat. It's like playing computer chess, it always wins. So here you see the, that tooth number four is way too early, then tooth number 14 distal, we still haven't taken away enough there, and tooth number three distal fossa. And that's pretty much it. The rest of it is all low force, nicely low force. The center of force jogs a little outward, but then it heads right to the middle. It would be better if it just headed to the middle, but that little jog outward is something you wanna detect. See how it's going to the right before it goes back towards the middle? That's because there's overload in this area early on. You can see it here by stopping the playback, learning how to drag and playing it incrementally and seeing all that takes place. Like if you're looking at the movie out here, you miss actually what happens in the six or five area. Watch what I mean. Watch carefully right there. That's the first contact to adjust. Six at that moment is higher than everything else except for four central fossa. So this is the first place to adjust, then four central fossa. Then you see four central fossa get much worse, six disappears. So you wouldn't have known it was there as an early fast riser unless you played the movie carefully. And then 14 distal and then three distal fossa. And so that's, we were getting there. This is two movies later, oh, we got a new warning. <laughs> T-scan doesn't like the load on, Tooth number 14, the patient is getting better at biting the first time than the second time, which could be that he's getting tired. Now you see how low force uniformity is beginning to form, but then it quickly changes. The implant cases are hard because there's no resiliency. So there's a lot of rapid force changes. And you see the center of force is hugging the middle, but this is ideal, but this isn't ideal. These four places and this one, they're not, um, they're not uniform. And we have to deal with these areas. So again, the same thing. Six is that one. Four, uh, five distal, four distal. Three mesial marginal ridge spreading out towards the mesial fossa. Any marks you see on the distal of 14, you would leave alone, right? And because that's low force. So like there could be a huge mark here on 12. Look at the size of that force zone. That could be a big black zone but it's low force, it's right there. You would never touch it. Use 
the rapidly rising columns as your guide. And this you can see. So we got to the end. And again, he bit better on the first one than the second one. And let's see what the end result really looks like. So here's, now we're going well past B and you see the center of force comes quickly to the middle and centers. We probably went back and took a little bit away from these two contacts, five marginal ridge, five four marginal ridge and three meso. But here we are approaching full contact. See, we're past B and you don't see any more pinks. You don't see any more reds. You don't see any more yellows. You see only low scale forces on this half of the scale down here. And that's a really good outcome. So that's what we're really seeking. Center of force hugging the middle and everything low to moderate force. Now, the interesting thing about this is what we really did was we sped up the time from A to B. So I'm gonna show you what I mean. We look at the A to B, A1, B1 time, and we look at how long it took for all those teeth to load. It's eight hundredths of a second. By, by playing all those individual fast rises and treating them in a series of movies, we now have simultaneity in eight hundredths of a second. Let's go back to the first movie and see what the A to B time is here. And it's actually 0.15 seconds. So we sped up the simultaneity by 50% from, from this to this. And look at the uniformity. Just have to take a little bit away from these two contacts. So that's how you really analyze what's going on. And that's how you know what to adjust. And as I said, in this case, we would probably treat five and five marginal ridge and three just a little bit more. Okay, so let me um, stop my share and we'll go back into the PowerPoint just to finish up. Let's see, share, PowerPoint. Yes, here we are. Share. Okay, come down a little here. Okay, so the T-scan is a huge benefit with all these areas of conventional dentistry. I'm a prosthodontist. I don't practice anymore, but all through my 36 years of practicing, I used all versions of the T-scan to deliver partial dentures, implant overdentures like this, partial dentures with class, partial dentures with attachments, Case finishing orthodontics is a huge area. The studies that we've done with the T-scan, Dr. Sarah Kadir and Dr. Julia Cohen-Levy have published many papers that show orthodontic end results are actually quite poor with extreme posterior force overload and very little anterior contact, as you can see here. And that sets up a problem for the patient's life. So finishing the cases, improving the orthodontic outcome is a huge area of T-scan success. Implant dentistry, this is how you cut down on your problems, is using the T-scan to control implant dentistry. Adhesive dentistry, the brittle nature of, of these cases that we do, glass ceramics. This is a seven-year recall photo of the case I showed you originally, and you can see how beautiful the case is. Conventional crown and bridge. Um, again, we don't know what the paper marks mean. And so you might want to line them up, and you might have your ideas as to how they should look, but use the data to, to optimize them, and then you'll be able to get really good outcomes. So uh, just a couple of notes for you. If you're interested in learning more, there's an upcoming <clears throat> disclusion time reduction course, which is a, um, the uh, T-scan guided treatment that controls TMD problems, muscular TMD problems. The next one is a two-day course at the Vivos Institute in Denver, Colorado. If you really want to learn how to help TMD patients without splints, without Botox, without, without all the the stuff that TMD patients go through. DTR has been proven over and over and over again since the late 1980s to be a very powerful treatment and it involves no splints, no chiropractors and um, no Botox. And it's the most effective treatment available because it treats the occlusion um, through the central nervous system, which is really amazing how effective it is. So if you're interested in learning about DTR, you can attend this course and use this code DTR23 uh, to register. The Vivos Institute is a very modern uh, sleep center, and um, they're excited to have myself and Dr. Sutter come and give our two-day course, and we'd love to see you there. The other thing I want to mention to you is if you want to elevate your T-scan learning and, and, and rapidly improve your the learning curve, you can have in-office training. In-office training 
um, is where you're in your practice with your patients and you can bring in any kind of patient that you want and your staff learns how to T-scan assist while you do all the recordings and you do all the corrections and I help you understand the data and I guide you through the treatment. And this really helps people uh, take their, their learning um, to a, a very high plane because you, you go through the entire process of recording, analyzing and treating with guidance. And um, so if you're interested in that, you can reach out to me at my email at the bottom or by phone, and I'd be honored to help you uh, learn chair side. It's, it's really a wonderful experience. So that's it for tonight. Um, I'm certainly available to answer questions. Again, I wanna thank TechScan for supporting uh, this presentation and uh, thank um, Shane for being the host, Shane Varga, who many of you know. And I hope it was helpful. I hope looking at the real data uh, gave you some insight as to what you should be looking for when you analyze things, when you get back your recordings. And um, I'll stop my share and I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, and we have several questions. Um, did you talk about your goals for All on X? Like, what are, are those similar to your goals for? Uh, I'll um, show them again. I'll, I'll I'll put them up again. Okay. Let's share this. They are similar. Um, let's see. That's implant fatigue. Here we go. They are similar. In that. Whoops. Sorry about that. Let me escape. Try that again. I'll just show it in the PowerPoint without without showing the slideshow. Did I put up? There we go. Yeah. So it's similar that you want to eliminate locations of force excess, which is again you're dealing with all the implants, not just two crowns like in my case. Centering the forces is the biggest difference. Centering the forces within the entire twelve implants is your an ideal outcome. So you have the center of force. As you saw in this last um, you know, delivery movie, how it came right down the middle uh, of the entire uh, upper and lower prosthesis. That differs from the um, unilateral implant case, the two units on one side or three implants on one side or one on the other side. In the, you always wanna favor the side which has less implants or has more teeth when you're controlling the center of force in single unit or two unit implant cases, or even three unit implant cases for that matter. And then overall, you wanna create low force uniformity, which is um, the same goal. And then again, developing excursions with very little shear. We didn't uh, go through the excursions on this patient. I think we ran out of time at his office, but those are the yeah, goals okay. for the full arch. Um, and there's several more questions here. Let me go to... Could you just grind the red spots that look heavy? I'm assuming he's talking about the T-scan red spots. Well, um, that's actually a very good question because it actually isn't a solution. What happens when you only address the highest forces and not the sequence of events, which is the uneven rising of the different um, non-simultaneous force rises, you don't get a good outcome. You actually get a center of force that zigzags around. It goes from one high force to the other high force. You don't get a straight line center of force. And so all you're really doing is taking the highest forces away, but you're not controlling the simultaneity. So that's not an ideal solution. It's much better to play the sequence and to find each of the fast risers and resolve those um, sequentially in one movie and then make another movie and resolve them in the next movie. And that's what you saw me do with the all on four scenario. All on six, I apologize. Okay. Uh, another question is, when we say we need a low force profile, how do we maintain them in a low profile as with time, the opposing dentition will erupt and end up in normal occlusion? Well, in the all on four, all on six case, um, they're not gonna erupt. And if you, you know, and this was going, asked, I think, back when you were talking about the, you know, when you have a couple implants versus the all yes. four, all on X. So the uh, two crowns that you saw in my mouth, they're in contact. There's no eruption going on. They're not that idea of pulling the paper mark, pulling the paper through. You can't pull the paper through on my crowns. That's why there's contacts there. So you leave them in contact so that there isn't 
eruption. You just control the forces with the data. And so you can go back. The answer to the question is you can go back and check the case every recall. I used to bring all my recall, all my prosthodontic patients in who had implants or fancy crown and bridge. When they were in the hygiene chair, we would go in and, and check them. And I'll show you an example of that. I'll actually go back. I, I, um, I'll show you the five-year recall on that case that I mentioned to you, and you'll get to see how similar it is. Let me see if I can escape the slideshow. I may not be able to go backwards. Let me see. Yeah, while I'm in the slideshow, it's hard to do. Yeah, I can't do it. Oh, good. I got out of the slideshow. Let me see if I can share it. Because I want to show you this, uh, this recall. Let's see if it's not in the slideshow. Good. Okay, so I hid this slide to save time. Let me go back to it. Here it is. Let me unhide it. Okay, I'm going to share the screen. Let me share it. Okay, I'm going to share the screen again. Okay. Okay. Now, this is the same. I showed this picture at the end. Let's see if the slideshow will come on. Now, this is five years after the delivery. Look at the data. It's almost exactly the same as when it left the office, except for this area and this area. So, the value of prosthodontic recall is over these five years, I had the patient come back for cleanings and we would touch up spots like this. And that's how you preserve the case. It also shows you that this is the center of force he left the office with and it's virtually the same five years later. If you have a really bad outcome, if you have a center of force that goes way out to the side or you have a 75-25 imbalance, you send the patient out the door with and they say it feels good, which is the barometer that many people use for success, but they're actually 75-25, that 75-25 is gonna to go to work on your prosthesis from day one, and it isn't going to change. It isn't going to fix itself. It's going to break stuff, right? So this is exactly the same five years later. It's amazing. So how you send it out the door really matters. And the long-term solution is prosthodontic recall. You bring the patient in, you scan them, and then you touch up places that become aberrant and that helps you preserve the case for the long term. This case has been in the mouth now since 2012, I think. So almost 20, well, 10 years anyways, right? And um, very little maintenance needed because it went out the door like this and it stays pretty much like that as long as you are willing to come and check it periodically. Okay, let me go back. Good. Okay, Ray, for another question? Sure. Can we use T-scan to adjust out contacts on articulator also before we place restos in the mouth? Yes, you can. Absolutely. Um, you would do the same thing. You'd make a clean recording with a good sensitivity, and you can, you can optimize the on the articulator outcome. The, the, the gray area really is how close is your mounting um, to what's really going on in the mouth. So you may improve it on the articulator and put it in the mouth and you may find that it isn't so close to what you measured on the articulator because if you think about prosthetic dentistry, very often what we get back from the lab looks beautiful on the articulator. We put it in the mouth and one side is hitting and one side isn't hitting. Or you know the patient bites down and only their anterior teeth touch and we have to grind the vertical down. But on the articulator, all the teeth were hitting. So the mounting has a role in how much using the T-scan in the lab will help you. But it certainly can uh, be an, improve the outcome on the articulator in the same way it improves the outcome in the mouth. Right. Can you please explain how you test for lateral excursions? Do you test direct closure first? Yes, so I'll go back and share my T-scan. Let me see so you can see. Here's my T-scan, let's see, here's my T-scan. So we'll go back to my case. Well, this is good, yeah. So every excursive recording starts with a closure element. So here I've turned this software on, it's running. I'm biting down here. I hold my teeth together and then I slide in one direction. And this is very important. You only want the person to slide in one direction. You don't want to have them bite down, slide right, slide left, slide forward. That doesn't work well because they never get back into full MIP when they do these other excursions. 
So you have them bite fully and you can see what happens. If I just play the movie and you watch, I'm gonna bite down and when I get to full contact, nothing's gonna change. It's just gonna stay like this. And then when you see the data on the screen in the recording, which you should be watching, stabilize like this, that's when you say to the patient, now slide to the right, and engage your canines. And we train the person beforehand. We teach them how to do it beforehand. And so then they'll start sliding to the right and heading towards their canine. And that's how you get a really good excursive recording. So this is the form you want to get. And the, 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 this is biting down, holding, sliding in one direction only. And that's how you get really good excursive recordings. And this is explained really well in those uh, T-scan research handbooks, um, you know, about high quality recordings and what they mean. Here's the left excursion, biting down, holding, sliding. And they should all be analyzed in quadrant view. At the distal of the canines is where the quadrant division should be of the working side canine. So here I'm going to the left. My concern is to keep the 11 data above the line and the premolar data behind the line. So this is the posterior quadrant, orange quadrant. This is the anterior green quadrant. So these colored lines, are with those quadrants. So there's the posterior left quadrant. The balancing side is the blue quadrant. That's where my implants are. And you see when I move, the center of force goes away from them and the uh, implants quickly disclude. And the center of force goes towards my canine, which is ideal. And so that's this is how you record and analyze excursions, always with quadrant view, never with half arch view. Uh, you'll never be able to see the true um, nature of the disclusion which is going on in here. And this, oh, this feature was what I was trying to show you. So if you click on that and then you scribe an area you want to see, it blows the graph up for you. So here you can see where C is, here's the, the four colored lines. You can see where the blue quadrant reaches zero is right there. The orange quadrant reaches zero, which is just before that. So D would actually be like right there. That's the correct exclusion time. And then you can reverse that with this feature. But I would tell you, you'll save a lot of time if you learn to read this without blowing it up. This is a great feature. It's a wonderful tool. But the skill a user needs to be able to do is read this graph without blowing it up. It'll save you time at the chair. Okay. Can you repeat uh, macro occlusion versus micro occlusion? Sure. I'll go back to the PowerPoint. So this is the macro occlusion. The macro occlusion is, whoops, sorry, go back one. This is the macro occlusion, right? We made the crowns. We think it all fits. We think the occlusion is good. This is actually the biggest misnomer in presentation dentistry. Everybody shows you the end result and, and, and we're supposed to believe that the occlusion is good because the macro occlusion looks nice. But it's not unless you really look at the micro occlusion. This is the micro occlusion. Whoops, sorry. Go back. This is the micro occlusion. What are the teeth doing? What are the forces? How, how simultaneous are they? Do they rise evenly? Does the center of force come down the middle? Does the excursive pathway go towards the canine? Is there balance? Right? Is there simultaneity of force rise? Well, in this one, there isn't, right? There's, these three places are a little too fast. That's why after five years, it's good to go back and adjust this and adjust this. So the micro occlusion is the occlusal contact forces and timing. The macro occlusion is the making of the teeth. And the thing you really need to grasp is that the macro occlusion doesn't guarantee the micro occlusion in any way, shape, or form. It can only be optimized by using the T-scan between the, between the crowns or the implants or the bridge work or the veneers. That's, that's how you get optimal micro-occlusion. You can't get micro-occlusion by making the macro-occlusion. They don't translate. So before you get out of your PowerPoint, one of them asked if you could show your team these you slide again. You mean the, the uh, lecture? Lecture course, I believe. Lecture time? Oh, sure. For. And then, so while we're shown that, the last question was, if you guys have any other questions, like now is the time to ask. 
the last question was how did you start implementing t-scan in your practice oh that's a great question um well i was very fortunate i have a unique history with the t-scan i was a graduate student in prosthodontics and it was built by my teacher dr william manis and we had one at tufts and i began using it it preceded all computers um, it was the first computer program um, at Tufts that was available for clinical use. There weren't any computers in the operatories at the school. We didn't have digital records. Everything was on paper. We, we made stone models and mounted on articulators. And, um, and so I began using it and I saw some very interesting things with it, even though I didn't know anything about it. So I started to work with it and tried to figure it out. And it took many years to actually figure it out. And one of the most important things I figured out was the was that in order to balance the bite, you have to treat all the uneven rises, not the highest forces. I did that like anybody else. You see a high column, a high colored force area, you can think, oh, I got to adjust that. But it wasn't until I actually figured out that you have to deal with all the uneven force rises that you get real balance and real simultaneity. So I had a unique introduction to it. And then I just left prosthodontics and continued practicing with it. In the prosthodontic program, I installed all my cases with it. I didn't understand it. It took me years to figure out the things that I've shown you today, many years. And, um, and so my evolution is unique in that way. Um, so I'm not a good example of someone who would like buy the T-scan today and then begin working with it. Um, in that situation, you really need training. And you know the T-scan the is a skill that one learns to be good at three things. You have to learn to be a great recorder. And it sounds simple enough to be a, a good recorder, but if you've ever attended a recording session with a group of dentists learning how to record, they make all kinds of mistakes. They hit the button too many times. They don't use a good sensitivity. They don't set up the dental arch well. They, 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 they struggle to get good data from patients. And so this, that's the most important skill to start with. The second skill is how to analyze the data so you need good data to be able to analyze good data. And of course, there's great training from the company that you get from um, one of the staff um, in the office who shows you all the tools and how to use the different software features. And then um, there are courses available, obviously, and one-on-one -on -one training is a great um, adjunct to company training. And so the third part is you have to learn to take the data that you've analyzed and make adjustments. So that, that's basically the process. And the way you indoctrinate your practice is to, is to put it into your occlusal procedures. So you're going to possibly make um, occlusal exams on patients, just like taking x-rays. And a complete occlusal exam is uh, a multi-bite, a right excursion, a left excursion, and a pertussive excursion. And in 10 minutes, those four recordings will show you much more than you'll ever be able to see by using a scanner or by or by doing something like Jaw with virtual articulation, which is just video of people moving around, it doesn't show you any interface pressures. T-scan data shows you incredible detail of what the teeth are doing. So um, by putting it into your occlusal procedures, such as making a diagnosis uh, of a new patient or delivering a denture or delivering crown and bridges with it, you learn to use it. And then you begin to see things like how helpful it is and, and how patients respond to it. Patients really love the T-scan because it, it eliminates them from deciding that the bite is good. And, and it puts the onus on, on us to give them a good outcome. And um, it's fascinating how they respond to it. And sometimes they don't think they have a bite problem and then they get adjusted with the T-scan and they go, you know, it's really so much better. I thought I was okay, but it's really so much better. Like that all on six case, the, pa the patient wasn't complaining. He, he got his teeth about a month before I came to train the doctor. And he said, yeah, it feels fine. And then when we were done, he goes, you know, this is so much better. I, I, I thought it was good, but wow, this is so much better. So you have to make an effort to first learn how to use it well. And then you have to uh, spend time in your office developing the skills that um, matter to use it well so that you help your patients. And the beauty of it is that it cuts way down on all these extra visits that people have, um, you know, of delivering dentistry. That's, that's the biggest benefit 
I would say to the average practitioner is that if you deliver your cases with the T-scan, you'll have a lot less follow-up, a lot less people coming back saying, you know, it doesn't feel right since I got my real teeth and I don't understand my temporaries were comfortable, but, you know, since I got my real crowns, I can't really bite on one side. And, you know, you eliminate all of that stuff um, by learning how to use the T-scan well. So it's, it's a tremendous adjunct to any, any procedure you're doing. But first you have to learn how to use it and then you can become efficient at it and then it really helps your practice. And it looks like it's all a question. That's actually a good segue question because our next course or our next uh, train session with T-Scan virtually is going to be Dr. Uh, ben Sutter talking about uh, implementation uh, into your practice and stuff too. So he'll help you with um, a lot of those questions of how he started to how he's using T-Scan uh, now in his practice. So I want to thank Dr. Kirstein for your time to share everybody with about an important topic like implants today. My and pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to everyone else for taking the time to listen and asking questions. This uh, will be recorded. This, this is being recorded. So you'll be, you'll be able to watch this session after. Um, I'm not sure if there's one more question or not. No, just great webinar. Um, Thank you. So this will be sent to you. So if you want to watch this video after, you can watch, rewatch this video over again. So without further ado, thanks everyone for your time and uh, we'll talk soon. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate you spending the time with us.